The Department of Defense has a budget of $817 billion for fiscal year 2023. More than $44 billion is going towards adding new warplanes to its fleet, which doesn't include the costs of training and maintenance. Fire number two, engine. From the estimated lifetime maintenance of $75 billion for the MV-22 Osprey fleet, to the $400,000 helmet fighter pilots wear to operate the F-35, this is how the military spends billions of dollars on its warplanes. This is the F-35B Lightning II. The Marine Corps' multi-role fighter jet is equipped with the most advanced sensor suite of any fighter in history and the most powerful engine of any jet in the world, which can reach a top speed of 1,200 miles per hour. It's just revolutionized what fighter aircraft are capable of. And these are the pilots training to fly that $100 million aircraft. A lot of people just think, you know, you show up, fly, and then go home, have a beer, but it's not all like that. Not only are you flying, but you're talking on four different radios. You're working the radar, you're working the t flare you're working the electrical optical system there while you're still navigating, talking to ATC, and then working weapons on top of that. Student pilots spend a year training to fly the F-35 Bravo here at the Marine Corps Air Station in Beaufort, South Carolina. This is a pilot's last stop before getting deployed to a fleet squadron overseas. And it's here they learn to handle the multi-role fighter jet in a variety of missions. We do strikes, so uh, aerial interception. We do OCA-DCA, so offensive counter-air, defensive counter-air, arm reconnaissance, and then uh, really the bread and butter though is seed, so suppression of enemy air defenses. The pilots we met are part of Marine Fighter Attack Squadron 501 also known as the Warlords. Once you complete here, they send you out to the fleet squadrons, you know, out in Yuma or Japan. Student pilots in the training squadron have already completed flight school, so training is focused specifically on operating the F-35B. Eventually, every fighter pilot that comes through the Marine Corps is gonna go fly an F-35. I'm uh, Michael Watts, I'm a major in the Marine Corps. My grandfather was a pilot in World War II, and I would always go to his house, see his models of his B-25 bomber. And also my father was a Navy pilot in Vietnam. So I kind of grew up with it, you know, in my blood. Right here, we're just basically starting, you learn how to fly the airplane, and then you go through all the different mission sets and basic skills. Because there are only so many jets that can fly at a time, most of the pilot's instruction comes on the ground, in the simulator, and in the classroom we weren't allowed to film some classified aspects of the pilot's instruction. But we were allowed to film the pilots practicing the aircraft's most unique capabilities and go behind the scenes as they suited up for a training mission. During training, it's crucial for the pilots to get comfortable executing the F-35B's Stovall maneuvers because they'll have to master those techniques on an aircraft carrier. Really the main thing is when we fly off the ship. So when I get out to Japan here in a few weeks, I'll eventually be learning how to fly off the ship. How do we get on there? We do vertical landings. How do we take off? We do short takeoffs. And so that's really the, the big reason why we're doing that. Lockheed Martin makes three variations of the F-35 Lightning II, but the Marine Corps' F-35 Bravo is the only one with Stovall capabilities. This feature is a big reason why the Marine Corps' 2019 aviation plan called for replacing its current fleet of aircraft with more than 350 F-35Bs. We're replacing all of the Hornets, all of the Harriers, and all the Prowlers with F-35s. Conventional jets need about 3,000 feet for takeoff, but in optimal conditions, an F-35B can take off in just a couple hundred feet. For a takeoff, we get onto the runway, and then at that point is when we initiate a conversion. We literally just hit a button, and then the plane like goes through its like transformer sequence, right? Once that's complete, we're now what's called Stovall mode. There's different kinds of short takeoffs we can do. My favorite's the, the button, it's called a button stow. And as I'm accelerating down the runway, and literally just click a button, and then the plane will take off by itself. It's pretty, pretty incredible. And then shortly after takeoff, we can convert back to conventional mode once we get to a certain airspeed. Once in the air, actually handling the jet isn't the most difficult aspect of operating it. 
It's actually a really easy airplane to fly. It's more difficult to process the amount of information it provides to you, I would say, knowing where to look at the right time. The student pilots already have experience flying jets, so much of their training is focused on utilizing technology unique to the F-35B. A lot of the difficulty is trying to absorb all of the information the jet's given you, operate all the sensors and the systems at the same time, and fly. And really, that's probably the number one struggle. Once a practice mission is complete, pilots must take on another of the jet's unique features, executing a vertical landing. Having never done it, it was an experience. My brain telling me not to slow down, because uh, in the Hornet, slow down, that meant you're going to fall out of the sky. It's a normal approach to landing, like you're, as if you're going to the runway, right? And then you're going to level off and then set a certain ground speed. And then at a certain distance from the pad, you're going to start a deceleration. And all that is is just a click of a button. And then from there, you're making sure that you're centered on the pad. Then you just push forward on the stick and then descend right onto the pad. I would say the first time doing a vertical landing in the F-35B is, is pretty crazy. You practice it a lot in the sim, you do it you know, dozens of times in the simulator, but the first time you do it in the plane, just slowing down for the first time like that and hovering over a pad with over 30,000 pounds of metal 150 feet in the air is pretty neat. Usually you have like the world kind of coming at you when you're flying, right? And so you're kind of sitting there just like looking outside as if you're like in the tower or something and you trust that you're, you're fine there, you know, that you're still flying. <laughs> Before stepping foot in the cockpit, student pilots need to familiarize themselves with the gear needed to operate the F-35B, starting with their anti-gravity suit, which helps prevent them from losing consciousness while operating the jet. It's a fabric material that has bladders inside of it, and whenever you pull G, it uses pressure from the engine to inflate, and then it prevents your blood from pulling down to your legs, and it pushes it up to your abdomen as much as possible. Each pilot's G-suit is custom made to fit perfectly around their lower body. And then we have a flight jacket that we put on and it has a bunch of survival gear. The pilot's flight jacket is filled with a multitude of survival tools in the event that they have to eject from the aircraft, including a flare, emergency strobe light, compass, survival knife, extra water, whistle, radio, and an oxygen mask. They have a code car for hand and arm signals, just a signal search and rescue basically. Then they have a signaling mirror, just a signal the aircraft was just a mirror and a reflection. Some less conventional survival tools are supplied by the pilots themselves. I always try to take my wallet in case I have to, to land somewhere else other than back here. That's happened to me before. You land somewhere and you have to stay the night, you don't have any wallet or phone or anything, which is kind of difficult. So uh, definitely take my wallet with me every time. In the event the pilots have to eject from the jet, their flight jacket is embedded with a unique safety feature. There's arm restraint lines that are routed throughout the jacket. When you eject, they pull your arms basically in towards your body. You're basically ensuring that your arms aren't gonna get flailed out into the wind. The jacket is also equipped with a flotation device in case the pilot has to eject over a body of water. So as soon as it touches the water, it will inflate the entire jacket so they don't have to do anything if their arms are broken or anything after ejection. Last but not least, the pilots learn to utilize the most technologically advanced piece of equipment, their $400,000 helmets. Each helmet is custom fit to its wearer, based on a 3D scan of the pilot's head. It's also equipped with noise-canceling headphones, night vision, and a forward-facing camera that records each flight. The pilot's heads-up display is projected directly onto their visor rather than on the glass at the front of the cockpit thanks to two small projectors inside the helmet. This allows the pilot to easily view key data, such as altitude, airspeed, and direction. Since the jet is able to help us so much, really flying should be second nature. That way you can focus on all of the information that the jet's given you. Finally, the F-35's distributed aperture system creates a 360-degree view of the jet's surroundings by stitching together feeds from six cameras mounted on the plane enabling the pilot to see through the base and walls of the aircraft. I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of work it takes to, to become a pilot, and a fighter pilot specifically. A one-hour flight, even a simulated one, might mean up to six additional hours of briefing, gearing up, flight inspections, and debriefing, not to mention the hours spent studying for each mission. 
So you could spend a whole day preparing and debriefing one single hour of flight. I think it's awesome to be in the fifth generation stealth fighter, kind of at the tip of the spear. It's a heavily weighted aircraft in terms of the combat power that the Marine Corps brings to the fight, and I'm honored to be a part of that. It's definitely pretty cool to you know carry on that tradition, talk to my dad about everything that I'm doing now and how it relates to what he did. All the airports that he flew into, you know, some of the ones that I've flown into as well. So he has stories. It's pretty neat. The F-35 may be the latest advancement in military aircraft, but the A-10 Warthog has been supporting troops on the ground for nearly 50 years. In 2007, the Air Force spent $1.1 billion to upgrade and replace the wings of 173 A-10 Thunderbolt II planes, which it expects to keep the aircraft flying until the late 2030s. This is the A-10 Thunderbolt II, more commonly known as the Warthog. The Air Force uses the A-10 for close air support, missions that require the plane to fly low to provide cover and assist ground troops in battle. So our whole mission in life and our whole job in life is to take care of the men and women on the ground. It's the only thing we think about, it's the only thing we train to, it's the only thing we talk about, and it's exactly what this airplane is built to do. But these pilots may be among the last to be trained to fly it. For years, the Air Force has considered retiring the A-10 in favor of the newer F-35 fighter jet. And that might finally be happening with Congress approving the Air Force's plan to phase out the A-10 over the next five to six years. But the public debate over the need for the A-10 continues. And while some A-10s are as much as 50 years old, F-35s cost about 60 million more per aircraft and weren't built solely to support ground troops. There may be a day that I am called to potentially help save someone's life when they're having the worst day of their life. That comes back to my training and making sure that I know what I'm doing in the jet. So how vital is the A-10? And could the Air Force soon be without one of its most iconic warplanes? So the only base that A-10 pilots train at is at davis Moffin Air Force Base. Before they fly the A-10, pilots train in the T-38 Talon during their initial flight training in Texas. They fly completely different uh, based on their flight performance and characteristics. The T-38 is kind of like a sports car. It's quick, it's agile, it's fast. But the A-10 drives more like a Cadillac. After graduating from flight training, new pilots move to their assigned posts. Really like the mission of the A-10 and thought it was super cool. I like the idea that it doesn't matter what I'm doing, that I'm strictly there for people on the ground. If you look at it, not the most attractive looking plane, if you will. Uh, it's pretty, pretty ugly. It doesn't have the swept back wings. It's got, you know, big Hershey bar wings on it for like added stability. So it's, it's just a mean looking airplane. And that's ultimately like what a warthog is. What sound does the A-10 make when it fires? You know, like bird, 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 and that's actually just the noise of the bullets exiting the barrel. This is the Gal 8 Avenger. It's a 30 millimeter Gatling gun. It's built by General Electric, and this is the largest Gatling gun ever built and put into an airplane. So it's got uh, it's seven barrels. It shoots at a maximum rate about 3,900 rounds a minute. There's almost no target that the Gal 8 is not a valid weapon uh, to use against. As we go around, the titanium bathtub is one of the features designed specifically to protect the pilot in the airplane. So this whole panel right here, where you see these giant Phillips head looking fasteners, that whole panel is titanium, so you can. You can hear all these are, are hollow aluminum. 
and that's rock solid titanium right there. This was one of the first fighter types that incorporated that into the design of the airplane. And it's the only one I know about that has a full bathtub encompassing the pilot. Uh, behind this panel right here, this is our single point refueling system right here. So pull that cap off uh, and fill the airplane up with fuel. Uh, we have four fuel tanks for a total of about 11,000 pounds of gas. If I'm topped off, I can fly for about three hours. And then once you add in aerial refueling, uh, we can fly pretty much indefinitely. And then as you're looking towards the back of the airplane, you can see we have a lot of hard points, uh, a lot of weapon stations on the airplane. There's 11 in total. And between those, we can carry up to 16,000 pounds of ordnance on those 11 weapon stations. This is a Mark 82 bomb body, so a 500 pound bomb body, just a, a blast and fragmentation type weapon that you drop it, it's unguided, on impact and it detonates. This is a uh, GBU-31. This is a 2,000 pound bomb with a GPS guidance kit on the back of it. So it's a, a coordinate seeking weapon, meaning I, I can input a GPS coordinate and that's exactly where that weapon's gonna go. But how does the A-10 stack up to the F-35 meant to replace it? Supporters of the F-35 say it has a huge stealth advantage, but detractors say it doesn't have the durability the A-10 does thanks to features like the titanium bathtub. Another concern is how F-35 pilots are trained. Insider reported that according to a 2022 training memo, no F-35 pilots are required to execute close air support training simulations in 2023 or 2024. For A-10 pilots, close air support is at the center of their training, which starts here in a virtual reality simulator lab. So they're going to start off in the VR lab, and that's going to give them the sight pictures and the references on the ground and the references in the aircraft for the first time. So simulators are extremely important. They're able to practice everything in a safe environment with you know, professional instructors before they get out and actually fly them on their own. Students familiarize themselves with the A-10's control panels and starting procedures before moving on to the flight simulator. We're going to open our air-to-air -air refueling door at this point. He was doing aerial refueling. It's a mission that the students actually perform in the aircraft pretty early in their training pipeline. Historically, without this lesson, it's usually taken about 10 to 15 minutes of talking to the students through getting the successful hookup in flight. Whereas now that we're able to have them practice with this lesson, they go out on that first flight having already done it before. We want to make sure, we want to take a look at our airspeed as we're in formation with the tanker. Now the feedback we're getting from instructors is that they're just going right up to the boom and they're getting their hookup on their first try. For the VR sim, you're getting the muscle memory. Um, so the first time we practice it in the jet, we know physically what we're doing with our hands, and uh, we know where our eyes should be, where we should gauge, and then our IPs are helping us fine tune those things. After spending a month in the simulator and learning the basic operations of the aircraft, pilots begin flying training missions in the A-10. Captain Lindsay Mad Johnson has five years of experience flying the A-10. Today, she's training for a new role to be a pilot on an A-10 demo team, where she will highlight the capabilities of the Warthog. I am about two hours shy of 1,200 hours in the, in the A-10 itself. They call it like a crawl, rock, run uh, process. So I did it in the sim multiple times. Then we go out to the airspace for my first time with a floor, not actual floor, but a simulated floor of 5,000 feet AGL. And then I go here, 2,000 feet AGL, 1,000 feet AGL, and then 500 feet AGL until I got through my first certification. After Johnson completed a few rolls and dives, she moved on to simulating a strafe, which is an attack on enemy ground forces a technique used in close air support operations. So when we do close air support, we are egressing, as they say it, from uh, in front of the target area. I'm going out about you know two, two and a half miles away at about 500 feet, and then I'm turning back around this way. And as I'm about just outside of a mile, I'll pop to about 30 degrees nose high, which allows me to get high enough to be able to see there is what would be designated as the friendlies and what would be designated as the enemy on the ground. 
And then as I visually acquire that out over my canopy rail, I'm then rolling in using both ailerons. My throttles are already in max. I'm rolling in and then I'm putting basically my nose position down on what we consider to be like a 20 degree wire. So rather than flying straight and level, I'm 20 degrees nose low towards the ground. I learned about the A-10 growing up. I knew I wanted to do something kind of to pay homage to, to my dad's time in service. I was young when September 11th happened. I was nine and he deployed two months after September 11th happened. That kind of stuck with me and I knew I wanted to do something that was gonna give back to my country as well. The A-10 debuted in combat in 1977, making it just shy of 50 years old, which is one reason many want it to be retired. For years, the Warthog has been the subject of debate between the U.S. Air Force and Congress. Some members of Air Force leadership have suggested retiring the A-10 to focus on developing more modern aircraft, like the $80 million F-35, more then why would you want to retire the least expensive, most accurate, close air support system? I don't want to retire, Senator, but the Air Force has to get bigger to do all this. But Congress has fought those requests due to the success of the A-10 in recent conflicts with ISIS and the Taliban and the plane's overall cost efficiency. It's tried and true. It's very rudimentary with the systems that it has, but why fix something that's not broke? It's been in every conflict that the United States has been in since Bosnia, Grenada, pretty much every contingent that, that the United States has been a part of, the A-10 has been pretty much a leader of all that. Last year, Congress approved an Air Force proposal to retire 21 A-10s, reducing the total fleet to 260, with plans to decommission the remaining planes in the next five to six years. People don't realize how much maintenance actually goes into keeping these aircraft airworthy. You know, it's not like a car, you know. When we wake up in the morning, we jump in the car, start it, and drive, right? These have starting issues, they have leaks, they're 40, 50 years old. They all have somewhere between 13,000 to 15,000 flight hours on them, uh, and that exceeds the actual life expectancy of the airframe by, you know, 5,000, 7,000 hours. A-10 critics may use the plane's maintenance issues to fuel their argument, but the cost of maintaining the F-35 jumped 15% between 2018 and 2020. What, what happens to you when you finish the training? Uh, once we all finish, we'll go to the different assigned bases, so I'll be going to Korea next. This is fun to fly. It does uh, a job that no one else does, and it's you're like, you're good at that. That is your thing, that's the A-10's thing. After completing the six-month training program at davis monthan Newly certified A-10 pilots will begin their careers as fighter pilots in the U.S. Air Force. The plane was built well before I was alive and knowing just like the generations of people that flew the plane before me were looking at the exact same gauges that I'm looking at. So it's, it's a pretty unique experience. I knew as like a younger child that I wanted to fly the A-10. My grandpa was in the Army. He has seen the A-10 like when he was in the Army do things and so that was even more just like a further drive to pursue the airplane. While everybody knows us for the gun, and its capabilities. A thing that we take most pride in as an A-10 community is protecting the lives of the men and women that are on the ground. All right, you want to fly a little bit, dude? That's what we need to fly what speed, right? Not all aircraft in the military's arsenal are meant for combat. Transporting troops, cargo, and casualties over large distances is essential for any military and the Air Force has a $340 million solution. Do a little low. Right actually here. where yeah. you kind of want them right now. I would, okay. I'd, I'd hold this. These Air Force pilots are refueling their C-17 Globemaster III at 26,000 feet in the air. That's good. Back, back. Now be patient. Let's see what it gives you. It does. Really good. The pilots rendezvous with a KC-10 refueler jet that pumps gas down through a controlled boom at 1,100 gallons per minute. Contact, boom, or pump. Five seven, contact. Nice uh, shot, Drew. Way to flex with it. Yeah. Break away, break away, break away. It's one of three missions we saw while embedded with a crew training to fly the C-17. At 174 feet long and 55 feet tall, 
the C-17 has a maximum payload of around 170,000 pounds and can land on runways shorter than 3,500 feet, with just three crew members manning the aircraft. We can do everything from supporting contingencies, so the war downrange. We can uh, support COVID missions has been a big thing recently. We can also do humanitarian missions, so helping uh, evac sick patients, wounded uh, soldiers. Due to its high payload capacity, C-17s were used in August 2021 to evacuate people from Afghanistan, with one plane carrying 823 passengers. The basic crew of a C-17, uh, there's three of us. There's a pilot, a co-pilot, and one loadmaster. So my role here as a C-17 loadmaster is to load these aircraft, whether it be helicopters, tanks, Humvees, ambulatory patients. Ultimately, our mission is to support someone else. The average salary of a C-17 pilot stationed at Travis Air Force Base is around $117,000. And the typical tour is about three years. Training happens here at Travis Air Force Base in Fairfield, California, one hour northeast of San Francisco. And before pilots complete missions in the sky, they practice the complicated maneuvers in a state-of-the-art simulator. It's pretty realistic. Uh, we use it to practice emergencies that you can't practice in the jet or you wouldn't want to practice in the jet, uh, whether that's multiple engine losses or really poor weather conditions. Fire number two, engine. Number two. Number two. Students train for emergencies like enemy threats and hydraulic failures. But the first scenario is a simulated engine fire. Could you please uh, scan the number two engine for us? Uh, we're showing engine fire indications. And then uh, I've got the radios, you've got the checklist. Roger. A lot of crew coordination happens at that time. So that's a good safe space uh, for young co-pilots to first get the feel for what the stick and power inputs feel like before you go do it in the jet. Emergency engine shutdown checklist is completed. Two hundred two one clear to land. Runway two one left. After practicing in the simulator, the crew meets in the briefing room to plan a live training mission. Uh, so training flight tomorrow. Showtime is a little non-standard. We're gonna do six thirty local showtime at base ops. Pilots and crew spend hours the day before a mission discussing the route, the objectives, and backup plans if anything goes wrong. So if we're in a failure to disconnect position, the main thing is just maintain a good, stable platform, keep doing what you're doing if you're pilot flying. The crew finalized their plans and were dismissed to prepare for the flight. Precisely at 1000, the crew boarded the plane and ran through their final checklists. The first exercise of the training mission refueling in midair. So air refueling is basically thinking about a gas station in the sky. Uh, the whole concept there is we have two aircraft meeting at the same point in space, so it can be um, potentially sensitive cargo you're carrying and you don't want to stop, um, or perhaps there's just not a good place to land, or maybe you don't have the time to land. Do a little low. Right you're actually where you kind of want it right now. I would, okay. I'd, I'd hold this. So we'll be about a thousand feet below the other aircraft and then eventually closing that altitude gap to where their boom, uh, that's the long pole that sticks out of the aircraft, to actually pass the gas from their aircraft to ours, we end up making contact with their boom. I think we got big throttle inputs yeah. in, the, in the back and up. And so you just have to, now you're going to have to work a little harder to kind of find the null again. Okay, good. Back, back. Now be patient and just see what it gives you. It does. A good saying is, uh, you know, aim small, miss small. When we're air refueling, we're focusing on very small details and trying to see like small movements because small movements that close can make a big impact. Refueling happens while pilots maneuver the C-17 at 300 miles per hour, nearly 30,000 feet in the sky. Contact, move it from. Five seconds, contact. Back up, yeah. For me, I was thinking about improving uh, my power movements, so my, uh, my stick movements, so my right hand, I was sitting in the right seat, were pretty solid, but like my, my throttle movements could have been a lot better. So it's something that I can work on in the future. Break away, break away, break away. That'll be break. Very nice. Nice job, dude. Phase two of the mission involves low-level flying, 
So low level flying during the day, we can go as low as 300 feet above the ground, which is pretty low for a large aircraft. Um, and the intent there is to stay below the radar picture of a potential adversary. So when you're lower, there's a few tactical benefits that we have that help us get to a not so great spot in a safer manner. All right, you want to fly a little bit, dude? That's what we need to fly, what speed, right? We need to fly 290. All right, set 290. Out there flying it, we're, we're uh, watching our altitudes and making sure that we're clearing any obstacles or anything like that. We also had another pilot in the back uh, looking at the map and the chart, calling out different towers on each side of the route and uh, helping us avoid them and clear them that way. Pretty sweet view, huh? Oh, yeah. The C-17 headed north towards Moses Lake, Washington to practice landing in an assault zone. So an assault zone is a short runway. Typically, they're about 3,500 feet. And then it has a marked zone that's 500 feet uh, long. And our goal is to put our aircraft in the 500-foot box and then use max effort to stop on the remaining uh, runway. Crews have to master landing on a traditional airstrip as well as temporary runways. So the tactical part of the C-17 is it goes to fields that uh, maybe have shorter runways or dirt runways, and oftentimes those are in combat locations or austere fields. Pull back up on the stick and put a little bit of power in. 500 feet in front of the zone. Not sure. And full stop, everybody. Minimum. 300 feet in front of the zone with a correction. Not sure. 50 feet. The final mission, a combat offload back at the Travis Air Force Base. Basically what we'll be doing is simulating a, an expedited offload. Typically if we're in a um, situation in which we don't have the equipment to do a download, if we have to get in and out really quick, maybe a hostile location. Once we release the lock, we'll say brakes released as well to the pilot, and then they will hit the throttles, release the brake, and the pallet will go out of the aft into the aircraft. We'll call load clear, close up, and then we'll get out of here. Overall, it was a great sortie for everyone. It was very busy and very long, so it's always tough to go fly for six hours and constantly be engaged. But I think everyone performed really well. I think uh, a lot of people relate cargo jets to like an airliner, but what we do I think is very different. Specifically, we go anywhere and everywhere in the world. Sometimes that means you have lots of information on that airfield, sometimes it means you have none. And so like I said, you have to be a problem solver and really think on your toes. So it's really rewarding when you go pick up um, you know, 150 guys who have been deployed for six months and you get to bring them home to their families. You're good to kiss off and maintain uh, 1,500 feet over the range. Not only does the MV-22 Osprey provide close air support, it also carries troops and cargo in and out of the battlefield. It uses a unique feature that gives it the ability to land in harsh environments where traditional aircraft cannot. But with several fatal crashes in the Osprey's past and high maintenance costs, proponents of the aircraft find themselves defending its place in the military's fleet. This is the MV-22 Osprey, flown by the United States Marine Corps. With a unit cost of about $84 million, it's the world's first production tilt rotor aircraft, which means it takes off and lands vertically like a helicopter. All right, get to go fast. But flies like a traditional turboprop airplane. We don't need that runway to land on, and we don't need any type of air traffic control agency to get us there. We can do it ourselves. When grounded, its rotor blades fold into itself, making it small enough to travel on naval carriers. The primary role uh, is what we call assault support. What that means is that we're good at carrying people and stuff places. When you're good to kiss off and maintain uh, 1,500 feet over the range. Insider spent a day at Marine Corps Air Station New River in North Carolina to find out what it takes to fly the Osprey. Before flying an Osprey, Marine Corps pilots must receive a four-year college degree and attend flight school to learn the basics. After that, you gain your wings and you show up at the fleet and you get about two months, three months to learn how to fly the Osprey. Osprey pilots spend 20 hours training in a simulator that was off limits to our cameras. I wanted to have a plane that was at the forefront of where the Marine Corps wanted to send things. Turns out that this was ex exactly the right plane for me. 
Today when we go fly, we're gonna do a whole bunch of various flight profiles. We're gonna go and shoot tail gunnery, and then we transition over to doing confined area landings. The training mission begins with a briefing in the squadron ready room. We're gonna take off out of New River as a section. For the departure, it's gonna be a standard vertical takeoff to climb up to our en route altitude of 3,500 feet. Safety is one of the most important topics of any Osprey mission briefing. Three U.S. Marines are missing right now off the coast of Australia. There have been 33 accidents, resulting in 42 reported deaths since the Osprey's first flight in 1989. The MV-22 originally in its induction phases and in testing, unfortunately ended up having a few accidents along the way, things that were worked out essentially over the years. The Osprey became operational in 2007. And since then, safety components like nacelles and software have been redesigned and reconfigured. I have over 800 flight hours on this plane with, with zero issues. That's in no small part to the maintenance efforts that are put forth by the Marines every day here. Crew chiefs at New River work as plane maintainers when they're not aiding on missions. Even the smallest things on the Osprey have to be looked at and are kept in good working order. We make sure that we're, we're flying the safest aircraft possible. Before every flight, Pilots and crew do a walkthrough of the Osprey to ensure everything is in working order. This is the Osprey, just a big overview here. Each engine provides you 6,150 shaft horsepower. So what that means for me up front is that I can go from zero to 280 knots and climb from the surface all, all the way up to 25,000 feet. This is the air-to-air -air refueling probe. This thing sticks out and lets me plug and refuel off of all kinds of different refueling assets and extends my range out beyond three hours out to all the way my limits that I can just stay awake for. These big nacelles here contain the engine itself and then also will contain all the different gearbox systems and different accessory drive systems that keep my aircraft powered up and flying both hydraulically and electrically. We have seats all up and down the left and right side that hold uh, 24 troops and then any type of cargo that we can do here. We have a lot of redundancy. We have three hydraulic systems. We have three flight control computers. We have four generators that will operate and they can all back each other up. So if any one component fails, there's numerous layers of backup and redundancy that allow this plane to keep flying and uh, keep fighting regardless of what happens. It is a gorgeous day to go fly. The downwash coming off of the Osprey is about the same as a Category 2 Hurricane. 170 at 9 good takeoff. Here for takeoff, runway 19, Elvis 1-1 one flight. Takeoff begins with the rotors in the vertical position lifting the plane off the ground. After reaching the desired altitude, pilots convert the aircraft to airplane mode. I have what's called a thumb wheel. On the throttle, uh, there is a, a little knob that I just move with my thumb. It's as easy as this. It takes little to no effort for me. What that means inside the plane and what the plane is doing is that I have uh, three different hydraulic systems that are controlling uh, what's called conversion actuators. And these conversion actuators are gigantic screws. And those screws uh, twist and make the whole nacelle structure move up and down. The crew flies north to begin the first exercise of the mission, firing the Osprey's machine gun at targets on the ground. On the MV-22, we have a ramp-mounted weapon system. We'll be firing the M240 Delta today, which is a 7.62 by 51 caliber uh, belt-fed machine gun. The ramp-mounted weapon system is used in a defensive role as we're carrying troops and cargo into an area. If we're engaged, we can effectively suppress that enemy fire or threat. The standard four-person Osprey crew consists of two pilots and two crew chiefs. So I'll be leading to the aircraft through the flight profile. Control level came back up. We're going to go ahead and try going fast again. I serve as the link between the pilots and the back of the plane. That's between our cargo, anyone we're carrying. I shoot the gun, uh, you name it. I suggest converting to see if we can get some of that back. Yep, one second. Copy. Sergeant Leneve will also be helping train an additional member on today's flight. I'm Lance Corporal Trantham, and I'm a crew chief on the V-22 Osprey. Every day is a new challenge and a new opportunity to learn something. Today we're going to be simulating engagement by a surface-to-air threat, uh, which is going to be a missile system, and we're going to attempt to suppress that threat. All right, Lenny, we're coming uh, across the runway target now. There's multiple vehicles and stuff on the on the runway. All the fires are going to be north of the runway, so on the left side of the aircraft right now. Copy, I've got, got a target. Contact, two targets. 
targets, steal targets. Crew chiefs trained to aim and fire the M240 Delta using the plane's forward momentum. It definitely takes a lot of concentration um, with the effects of your forward momentum. Getting the rounds to hit your target, you have to aim in a certain way so that your rounds hit with the proper momentum. If their target is to the left of the plane, they aim low and left. If they shoot off the right side of the plane, they aim high and right. We're going to basically be looking for good uh, impacts on the target. In the training mission's second phase, the crew flies over a field to practice landing in a confined area without a runway. So we'll do uh, what we call tactical straight-ins, where we go from uh, airplane mode, um, going 240 knots, and bring it all the way to a hover inside the zone. So it's going to take us from this in route airplane, and then the computer and the software, the automation, is going to fly the plane all the way along a course of flight and bring us into a hover over a specific landing point. So it's pretty cool. Forward thrust comes off the propellers. That generates lift over the wing, just like any traditional fixed wing aircraft. Then, pilots redirect that thrust by converting into helicopter mode. We start shifting that lift vector backwards to slow ourselves down or forward to accelerate ourselves, and we go from there. After completing confined area landings and takeoffs, the focus shifts to the third exercise of the mission training crew chiefs how to measure the plane's distance to the ground with just their eyes. Hey guys, traffic starts 10 o'clock, high, no factor. They have to calibrate their eyes to give uh, accurate distance calls to the deck, and that's, that's a challenge, and it changes based on what you're expecting to see. They need to happen quickly. They need to say exactly the right thing at the right time so that we know what we need to do and take, uh, take that information on as like actionable information. So she'll, she'll get it down uh, during a daytime landing inside a grassy zone. And then we'll take her and we'll fly her at night and we'll put on uh, MVGs, night vision goggles on her and she'll have a 40 degree field of view looking through toilet paper tubes. And then all of that uh, distance estimation that she's worked on starts to go away. That's part of the training that we, we work with them on. Flying the Osprey for the, for the Marine Corps has meant to me that I can be operationally employed in a very wide range of mission profiles. As we shift over to the Pacific Theater, what we're dealing with are longer transits over water without land bases for us to operate from. The Osprey is also used to provide humanitarian aid. Personally, I've done uh, hurricane relief operations in Puerto Rico. Uh, and I've been able to deliver food and water to people that have needed it. We were able to land uh, in zones, baseball fields, all across the island. The people were writing uh, help in their yards and stones and, and trash to get uh, the Ospreys to come in and land, and we were able to bring food and water and medical supplies all over the island. Today was great. It was a good flight. A lot of the future operation concepts of the Marine Corps are going to focus on the Osprey, doing more of what it does and doing it better. I'm actually applying to the Naval Academy right now because I am interested in becoming a pilot. If I get accepted, I'll have four more years in school and graduate and commission as an officer. The whole way that the Marine Corps trains is to add more assets and be able to bring a more complicated fight to the battlefield. We're just a small aspect and a small piece of it, but that's what we bring to the fight. Fully loaded with a weapon system designed for precision attacks on the ground, the $165 million AC-130J Ghost Rider is a key asset in the Department of Defense's strategy to deter adversaries from sparking future conflicts. It's about 43 pounds around itself, so it's pretty big. Normally, whenever we fire this, it recoils about 43 inches back, uh, so you'll feel the kick, definitely. We, we feel it from the seats. Pilots up, up front feel it. Everyone feels it. This is the 105 millimeter cannon on the AC-130J gunship, nicknamed Ghost Rider. The cannon is located here, on the left side of the plane, along with a 30 millimeter gun. Both weapons take out targets with extreme precision. Over the last 20 years in the Middle East, 
the U.S. military used the AC-130 to provide heavy fire against insurgents to protect U.S. forces on the ground. But now, the military says its current adversaries, in places like the Asia-Pacific region and Europe, require it to be more targeted. And the newest model of the AC-130 is meant to help it achieve this mission. Continue to let this target develop for a second. Let's get eyes on them, and if they start moving this direction, please let me know which BP is going to be the closest. Insider visited Cannon Air Force Base in Clovis, New Mexico, to find out how the Ghost Rider is built for precision and how training on this gunship is evolving to prepare crews for the threats of tomorrow. We're able to get places faster and stay there longer. Its engines are roughly 25% more efficient, which means we've got roughly 25% more loader time. We have the ability to stay on station for that much longer. Also, with the more fuel efficient engines, and it is roughly 20% faster. That's compared to the AC-130W. The J model became fully operational in 2017 to aid in close air support for ground troops, gather intel from above, and perform controlled bombings with precision. All right, so yeah, this is gonna be the 30 millimeter. It's our GAL 23. That's an incredible weapon, very precise. The J model was built with a precision strike package, which has two weapons, starting with the 30 millimeter gun. So it's going to be made up of a barrel, upper receiver, and the feeder assembly. And then within it, it's gonna have your flexible chutes that feeds the ammo into it. Air Force leadership has said that because of its accuracy, the 30 millimeter gun is almost like a sniper rifle. This is gonna be the 105 millimeter Hauser. Normally you have two gunners that are gonna be here working it. One's gonna be loading it, the other one's gonna be pulling the brass out. And then there's gonna be where we store the ammunition for it. So the firing is also gonna be like the same for the 30 millimeter. The personnel at the mission operator pilot are going to select the gun. And from there where the sensor is pointing, the gun will slave to that position. And then you just fire it with a trigger based off the hands-on throttle and stick. So this is gonna be the MOP, or referred to the mission operator pallet. So in these two seats here, you're gonna have your combat system officer on the left seat, and then the weapon system officer here on the right seat. And these co are correlated with the sensors on the outside of the aircraft. So for this one, it's gonna be the sensor off the nose of the aircraft. And then for this seat, it's gonna be the sensor on the left hand side over there. So for this, this is where we control all of the munitions, a lot of the radios, we're talking to the guys on the ground, and then both the guns. What's unique about us is we've got two of, I think, the best sensors in the Department of Defense, personally, and the MX-20 and the MX-25. These two sensors are a key element in how the AC-130J crew collects accurate intelligence and confirms the location of targets before employing its weapons. Due to the sensor's classified design, our cameras were not permitted to film them when the lenses were exposed. All right, so right here on the pilot station and is also located at the co-pilot station. You're gonna have your heads up display. Um, just extra SA for the pilots. It's gonna give them a lot of their navigational tools so they can see and then maintain SA while having eyes out on the aircraft while, while flying as well. That way they don't have to look down. It kind of just helps uh, keep the crew safe. In addition to the heads up display, uh, you have the side heads up display for the pilot. Because both weapons are on the left side of the plane, pilots fly in circles when observing and firing on targets. It's going to help with the employing the munitions and it gives them better SA on the battlefield. Another update to the J model are its more efficient engines, which allow the plane to fly 25% farther and 25% longer than the earlier AC-130 models. Luckily, there are several amenities on board to provide comfort on these longer flights. Pretty cool feature is we have a microwave in addition to a, a coffee maker as well. So kind of a nice way on the longer flights to heat up your food. Um, that way you're just not eating cold stuff all the time. So yeah, actually for myself, I was on the longest flight in ACJ history, 16 hours, uh, headed out to Japan. And it, it was nice just to heat up some warm burritos as opposed to having like a cold sandwich, something like that. So we do have a, a toilet on the aircraft um, for the longer flights. It's super nice to have. So it just comes down like that, and then there's a little curtain for privacy, and then you just flip it up, and yeah, just like a, a normal toilet. So it's definitely needed on those longer flights. Now with us being out of the global war on terror, I mean, it's not a priority anymore. We're moving towards more 
current events happening in the Pacific, uh, maybe some things in Europe, if you've seen the news. Nicknamed the Angel of Death, the AC-130 has been used in past wars to provide heavy gunfire to protect troops on the ground or to clear out an area of enemy forces. But that mentality is changing. In previous conflicts, they're really simple. People would run up on the side of mountains with Soviet-era machine guns. And you knew for a fact that that guy met the rules of engagement. That was a legal strike to do. According to the 2022 National Defense Strategy released by the Department of Defense, a key priority moving forward is integrated deterrence, which according to Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, means having weapon systems and technologies that make adversaries think twice about engaging in conflict. That's why the J model's precision weaponry and sensors make it a crucial military asset. And why Ghost Rider pilots are now trained on knowing when to engage in conflict. There's a lot of training that's required for us to shift away from the global war on terror. We still fundamentally want to protect the friendly force, but we have to be discerning, and that's the really tough part. And so you want to train to, hey, you got your, your spider sense, your spidey senses are tingling. Let's play this out. Let's develop this scenario while not putting the friendly force at risk. Right now, we want to sh stop short of actual conflict. All right, guys, we're going to take off. We're going to go up to the Clovis area. For gunship crews to prepare for potential conflicts abroad and become skilled in precise deterrences, they perform weekly training missions at Cannon Air Force Base, which all begin with a pre-flight briefing. I'd rather bust a timeline but be safe than rush to failure. Leading the mission today is Major Riley Feeney, an evaluator pilot. For weather out of here today, uh, it seems to be just fine for takeoff. However, we may be getting gusting winds at like 270, uh, up to 30, possibly 35 knots per the meth. Today's flight will begin with basic pilot training, but will then move to a simulated kill or capture mission, a training scenario that will take lessons learned from previous wars and force the crew to be more precise and cautious. All right, team, so we are uh, working with Task Force 1.6 Team USA. We're after Objective Red Dragon. Uh, it's, it's a kill capture mission. It's a, been a guy, he's a arm smuggler, uh, been working out of the town of Clovistan. As the weapons officer, Captain Rushi Gohel has been tasked with creating a mission that will train the crew on scenarios they encounter. It's all made up, but it's based around the different threats that we'll see that we're fighting in the current fight. We'll be working in building 1-0, particularly he's hidden up in the shed right in the back. This is what he's looked like. He's known to be uh, traveling with a small posse. The crew will be attempting to locate a fictional threat who is thought to have a weapons cache. The team must find the threat, relay that information up the chain of command, and then decide whether to neutralize him. Ready, right. right. Let's go to war, boys. And copy, takeoff clearance, get us straightened out here. Line of checklist has been called complete. Hey, firm, ready to go, Cope? Ready. All right. Textbook, well done. Once in the air, the crew starts the training scenarios. Feels good to be in the air, doesn't it? And so we went down to Roswell to get a couple of instrument approaches. There are specific approaches with ground-based nav aids navigational aids that allow us to put the aircraft in a safe position to land down in Roswell. Okay, point airspeed center line, bird, bird, no side, no factor. It was an excellent training iteration today because it was turbulent winds with gusty winds, just basically an eight on the 10 scale of difficult, which I thoroughly love, even if it's difficult for the remainder of the people on the crew. Right, yep, well, just a little bit too much, stable, 50, 40. 30, 20, 10, and walk it down. So we have an additional capability in this plane which can take us down to 100 feet. If, say you got a absolutely socked in weather and the ceiling is very low, we can utilize this system to land safely and be aligned with the runway. 
where you simply couldn't visually see the runway. You get to follow these guidelines and get yourself very low to the ground and land. Incredibly important if you got a ground party who's 300 miles away and they need you to come help them. Once the pilots finish practicing landing at Roswell, the training shifts to the back of the plane. Fortunately, the live fire range was closed due to uh, some extreme weather that had occurred recently. However, what we did is a dry fire scenario. All players, all players, assault force is internal to objective building. The crew began searching on the ground for the location of their fictional insurgent. All right, I'm in the objective area. Uh, just getting a quick eyes on target building. Unable to uh, pee any weapons yet. Uh, we'll continue scans. After several minutes, Gohel spotted a potential target. I have contact currently about eight packs. They are unloading weapons from two trailers uh, located 300 meters north of their position. Uh, they look like they're uh, game planning and re getting ready to move. I don't know what direction. All right, hey, and uh, from Jackal, from Devil, continue to let this target develop for a second. Let's get eyes on them, and if they start moving this direction, please let me know which BP is going to be the closest. We will hold off on breaching until we have an idea of what these packs are going to do. One of the items the crew was practicing today was following the rules of engagement before firing on a target. So the rules of engagement are, and they were really, really well defined by the kind of the tail end of what was the global war on terror. The explicit verbiage in them is, is relatively classified, but the idea is you have to meet certain criteria in order to be engaged. Able to PID two packs once he's been carrying some sort of long cylindrical object. Before Gohel fires the weapons, the aircraft commander must give consent. I mean, so we have consent, let's well, go. You're clear to engage with 30 and 105, Mike, Mike. Five, four, three, two, one, splash. Devil, we are taking cover. You guys are continuing to prosecute until all packs are down. I got six not moving, just uh, duo running south, closing on friendlies. All right, good impacts, good impacts. All players, all players, touchdown, jackpot objective. The mission was a success and a vital scenario for possible upcoming threats. We wanted to give it a little bit more of a flavor of, say, kind of the next theater that we're looking into, which is the Indo-Pacific theater. And what we wanted to do today was kind of throw out, hey, look at this thing, should you shoot it? And, and really challenge people with, well, does it meet the rules of engagement? Awesome. Hey, appreciate you guys playing today. I realized today was a lot more bumpy than you wanted it to be. Good news, we got the mission done. We're able to get some parole to back in. And honestly, I thought that was a really good training route for us today. I thought the crew did very well. They were very quick and all of their engagements they did so legally. The one thing I did want to bring up though was we were very expeditious and we were about 20 meters from danger close on the engagement for that Romeo 9 Echo. We didn't do anything wrong. It was contact. Everything was within limits. We were out at like 230 meters away, but it's one of those ones too, like just as a technique, and this is my instructional fix for the crew, is anytime that you're within 25 meters, of a danger close engagement, you probably should be talking to the to the JTAC. So I thought they did a good job, and I thought Captain Boone did an exceptional job of leading the crew, which for me, the big ticket here is watching pilots, watching aircraft commanders develop into leaders. The potential of the AC-130J continues to grow to keep up with the military capabilities of its potential adversaries, Air Force Special Operations Command has started testing a new high-energy laser weapon that could one day replace the 105mm cannon. Air Force leadership says that with this, targets could be permanently disabled without the slightest bang, whoosh, thump, explosion, or even aircraft engine hum. It's very fun to take this tool, which has just absolutely been a hammer uh, in the global war on terror, and then pivoting it to uh, just a, where creativity is king and, and enabling that. See if I can find, I see Lowe's, I see Walmart. Yep. They put in a new skate park over there. By the uh, Green Acres. Skater die. 